Praise the Lord, everybody. If we could stand tonight. The Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why don't we just begin to bless the name of Jesus tonight? Why don't we begin to exalt the name above every name? There is no name like the name of Jesus. There's, there's no salvation in any other name besides the name of Jesus. I, I praise the Lord for what he's doing. People are hungry for the things of God. I'm, I'm grateful to be here tonight. I, I'm, I'm excited about the word of God. I'm excited about the teaching of the word, Brother Cody. It gets me excited. My faith has been high all day. I'm thankful for a pastor who preaches truth, whose foundation is Jesus Christ, and he builds upon it. I'm thankful for that truth. Hallelujah. Mm. Jesus is in this place tonight. Um, on the way here, Katie and I were leaving the house, and um, we pulled out of the driveway, Brother David, and I I told Katie, I said, it, it's just beautiful out here. After the rain and the storm has passed, there's, everything's blooming out and there's life. You know, and Brother Christian, I began to think about Noah when there was a flood and it rained that 40 days and 40 nights and everything that had the breath of life that didn't go in the ark, it died. There was death. But after the storm, there was life. The things we go through, the storms we go through, when we come out of them, there is newness of life. When I, when I die to myself and I get buried in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, I am a new creation and there's newness of life. There's fruit when I come out of those tough seasons, Brother Terrence. There's love and there's joy. Hallelujah. Why don't we just praise the Lord tonight? Why don't, why don't we just let our faith increase tonight in the name of Jesus? I love you, Lord. We're going to go into prayer tonight. Let's do something. We do this occasionally, but I want to, do, I want to just mix it up a little bit tonight. While faith is high, I really feel like faith is in this room tonight. And I, I want to act on it, Brother David. If, if you have a need, and what I love about prayer, you can pray about anything. You can take anything to the Lord. If you need anything in this place, I want you to just come forward. Let us just come forward and pray together tonight. If you need a miracle, if you need a healing, uh, if you need faith, if your family needs a touch, Jesus can do it. My God can do it. For with God, all things are possible. And he's in this place tonight. And I'm telling you right now, if you just get a touch of him, if you just get a touch of his garment tonight, he, everything can change. All pressures can bow at the name of Jesus. Sickness can bow at the name of Jesus. Depression can bow. These distractions can bow at the name of Jesus Christ. Why don't you just lift your hands in faith tonight? Lord, I love you. I'm so grateful for your presence in this place. And Lord, I pray that you bless those who have stepped out in faith tonight. God, if they need a touch in their mind or in their body, I pray under the power and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, let it be done. Let healing come. Let renewing of the mind come tonight. Let restoration of their families come tonight. Lord, restore what they've lost. Heal the brokenness. Heal the depression, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. God, I pray, Lord, that you heal our city. I pray for crime rates to come down. I pray for sexual immorality to come down. I pray for depression and confusion and every evil spirit to come down through the preaching of your word, through our Bible studies, through our witnessing, through our door knocking. God, I pray that, that we will be the light in this community. Lord, the darker it gets, let the brighter our light shine. Lord, I pray that your word go forth tonight and, and people respond out of faith, that there is a change, Lord, that we apply the things that are taught, Lord. We pray these things in the mighty and only saving name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Hallelujah. My chains are gone and I've been set free. I can't th help but think about Brother Brenton Isaac as he was bound on that altar, just like we're bound to sin. And Jesus takes our place just as that ram took Isaac's place. Jesus takes our place. And I'm free. Because in the name of Jesus, I am free. I am free from the things of the world. I am free from the influences of this world. And I have victory. I have victory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to go into our giving tonight. We have Givelify, PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We have pans for tithing and offering, and you can also text to give at 833-883-9311. There, there is a scripture that I've been praying through lately that I'm just going to share real quick before we pray this. Um, it's out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? I think about we live in a farming community. You think about the birds, Brother Andy. They find corn on the side of the road. In the mornings when I'm driving to work, I see all the birds finding worms in the ground. If he can provide for them, he can provide for me. If he can provide for the birds, he can provide for my family. And I'm going to give to the kingdom of God because I want to see his kingdom go forward. Forward, and I know that he can, can take care of us. So why don't we say this with faith tonight? Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saving God and perfect health and abundance walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hallelujah. Why don't we just praise the Lord one more time? Come on. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you for your presence, Jesus. You can be seated if you'd like tonight. And Riverbend kids can come forward. Aren't we thankful for our children? Amen. Hallelujah. They can change the world. They're the future generation. But I believe they can do things now. I believe they can reach people in their schools now. I believe they can influence their home now, Pastor. I believe it. I believe it. So let's pray over them tonight. Let's pray over our teachers. Let's pray that they can connect. And let's cover them. Let's cover them in the blood tonight. Stretch your hands forward. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray a covering over these, these children. I pray a covering over their minds and the steps that they take. Lord, I pray that every step they take in their school, every step they take in their home, it's in your will. Lord, I pray that you begin to use them now. And I pray that their minds are open to your word now. I pray it. I pray that the teachers are able to connect. They're anointed to teach, Lord. And that revelation would come back there. Revelation of the name of Jesus. Revelation of baptism, Lord. Revelation, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. I cover them and I cover their family and their home. I pray for good, kindly, good, godly conversation in their home. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead and lead them back, buddy. Hallelujah. And we have no river bend ignited tonight, so we're going to turn it over our pastor. If you're excited about the Word of God, why don't you just clap your hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. I can't wait for what Pastor has for it tonight. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Brother Blake. And, uh, yep, he's getting ready. I'll be honest with you. Uh. We'll just see how it goes tonight, whether we open up for a whole lot of comments or not. Uh, I, I like comments, but sometimes we get sidetracked. And so I just kind of play in it by ear. But uh, this, this Bible study has been brewing for a couple of weeks after y'all bogarted church away from me a couple of weeks ago. And... Uh, and then, then last week I wasn't here. Uh, so I'm glad to be back tonight, aren't you all? Amen. Glad to be here. Yes. Amen. And uh, I want to talk to you just a little bit before we get into the Word while, while the fellas are handing out the, the handout. Um, Monday night, uh, let me just say this. Uh, there's a lot of things we can forego, but prayer is not one of them. Um, so with that being said, Monday night, I felt, well, actually a month ago, I felt like the Lord wanted me to come and be a part of the ladies' prayer. And uh, uh, I, I want you to know that uh, we had a great prayer meeting, for one thing. And... Uh, uh, I value as an essential component of the growth of this church, I value praying ladies. I value everybody's prayer, but there's something special about a praying woman of God. Uh, there is, whether you amen it or not. I heard like two amens over here. But uh, it is it is a beautiful thing in the mind of God and there's an effectiveness that is increased with praying women and let me tell you this if you are spending more of your time praying you don't have time for things that get you in trouble so uh, I also want to let you know that we'll be I don't know what it looks like I don't know how fast it'll move as you know me I try not to move too fast but uh, we're 
I, I'd like for you to start ramping up your commitments now to God, to prayer, to fasting, etc. Because we're going to work out a little bit more organization, you know, ministries and, and different things, care groups and so on and so forth. But I got to have people that are committed. Maybe we need to just change the Bible study up. Uh, there, there's a, uh, I, I felt it in prayer this morning. Everybody loved Jesus till he started asking for a greater commitment from him. And that's like when they begin to go away. I don't believe that's going to happen here. I believe we've got some hungry men and hungry women that God's put some burdens and desires on you already. And uh, we're going to try to see about bringing those into action. Amen? Amen. Um, be prepared for some deep moves of the Holy Ghost as we activate our prayer lives more. I'm going to say one more thing to you. Let's, let's try to ramp up. I know everybody works hard. I know you work hard. I, I'm not belittling what you're going through at all, what you struggle with in life at all. But we're going to have to ramp up our pre-service prayer. Or, excuse me. We're going to have to ramp up our pre-service preparation. Y'all right. right. with me now? Yes, sir. Everybody got their hand out already. But it's time to go to another level. And with another level, you get another devil. That's not unique to me, but I heard somebody say it, and I like it. Because it's true. And uh, uh, we've been teaching about holiness. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I've prayed yesterday and today especially, but I reached out to some friends of mine just just, just searching for some direction. And, and uh, one of them said to me, he said, have you been teaching a holiness series? I said, yes, sir. He said, you don't need any discernment beyond the delivering of the word of God. Because the word of God was already working on what you're struggling with. You go back. I, I can go back through my notes because I got all of them. In case y'all was wondering. I can go back through them, Brother Logan, and I can find time after time after time when I dealt with stuff specifically that rears its head up. And the enemy would make you think. You're doing a terrible job. Look at all this stuff popping up. But the word says you've already dealt with it. And that may be why it pops its head up. Huh? Because of the first step in spiritual warfare is you let the enemy know you're aware of him. So uh, God's on the move. And this is holiness, holiness of dress and gender distinction. Um, and that is the, the foundational principle behind this. Is gender distinction is godly. It is creative order. God made men and women distinct and different and unique and, yes, completely equal and essential in the kingdom of God. I've said this a couple of times. I, I know, especially in some old timers and then in some people that want to try to lie about what the Bible says. The Bible does not validate me, Tarzan, you, Jane cultures. It does not. It does not validate that you married a slave, men. You did not marry a slave. God put you together with somebody that's good at things you're not. Let's review a little bit. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 and 40. And these all, who's these all? Nope. Hebrews 11 people. So he rose of faith. And these all, having obtained a good report, who did they obtain a good report from? The Lord and subsequently others around them. And I've told you, and I'll say it again, when you get right with God, You'll be right with everybody around you you need to be right with. And having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. 
God having provided some better thing for us. Who is that talking about? Us. Yes. That they. Who's that? Hebrews 11. And those that have gone before without us should not be made perfect. You and I are just as essential to the ultimate plan of God coming to fruition as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the book. Okay? Wherefore, seeing we also were compassionate about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience or confidence, endurance, the race that is set before us. So when they obtained a good report, it means their lives witnessed of their faith. They lived a life indicative of having great faith in God. When you believe in God, the world is different. When your faith is where it's supposed to be and when my faith is where it's supposed to be, I live a different way than when my faith is low. When I'm living high faith, I'm living spiritual and I'm led by the Spirit. When my faith begins to decrease, I start trying to find a way to bring a baby into the world because God didn't move fast enough. Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, remember that? That's what happens when you get a faith failure. All right? That's why the Lord prayed for Peter's faith. You got to hold on to your faith. You got to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to saints. But those that obtained a good report didn't receive the promise. They lived according to faith without the promise of the Spirit or even seeing the end of their faith. They did not get to a conclusion of what they believe in. Ladies and gentlemen, there is an end game for God using you and in your life. There is somewhere you're going. You may die. We may all die before the trumpet sounds and the rapture takes place. But trust me when I tell you, there is a promised land for every one of us to live in, to occupy, to possess, and function in, which is the fulfillment of the plan of God in our lives. Amen. But these people didn't get the promise. We did. God providing some better thing for us. They did not have the infilling of the Holy Ghost to help them, to encourage them, and to strengthen them. We have a responsibility to finish the work that God started in our spiritual fathers. The manner in which we will accomplish this is to intentionally and on purpose lay aside every weight and every sin. So there are two different things. Every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and the sin that so easily causes us to be tangled up, that causes us to fail, to fall, slow us down, hinders us from God accomplishing what he wants to in us. God will not just overlook our weights and our sins so he can just get his will done. We are in cooperation with him, in cooperation with the Spirit, getting rid of weights and sin so we can be what God needs us to be. Yes. Lord, help me just go stone blind till I finish preaching this. There ain't nothing in the world happening tonight more important than what you're getting right now. I'm not being ugly, but I, just, I warned you in the beginning. I'm calling you to a higher commitment. That's right. Amen. Higher level of, we got to. We've got to. We've got a world behind us counting on us and a world ahead of us counting on us and the world that we live in counting on us. Okay? And, and I, the depth of the spirit that we enjoy in our services is by and large accomplished by our surrender to the will of God in our lives. There's a depth of the spirit when we're submitted that's not there when there's a war between the spirit and the flesh. So let us run with patience, steadfastness, endurance. The, the definition that I read with this said, especially as God enables the believer to remain under the challenges offered in life. There are going to be things that cause a hindrance in your mind in life. 
you're going to have to fight through it. You're going to have to hold up under it. So it behooves us, since we know how important the responsibility is on us, to go to the scriptures to determine exactly what does it mean to lay aside weights and sins that tangle us up and mess us up. We have, over the last several weeks, and I, I warned you when I started on holiness, that it might take up to a year. Y'all remember that? I told you it's going to take a long time. We have probably, possibly, too much in depth taught of our responsibility to maintain a holy mind, which shows up in how we behave, primarily in the way we speak, but also in the way we live our lives and present ourselves. Present ourselves. We've learned that we are in fact called to present ourselves, to present our bodies. Everybody say my body. My body. To God as a living sacrifice. Yeah. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Which is evidenced by a refusal to pattern ourselves after the world. Which is evidenced by a refusal to pattern our lives after the world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That has to happen. But what we have to get in our head is we've got a convoluted mindset that when we lay aside the weights and the sins that somehow we're being penalized. We're not being penalized. We're setting ourselves up for a heavenly transformation. We're setting ourselves up to have our minds transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost and to become what he wanted us to become all along. We're being transformed, metamorphosed into what God wants us to be. And that change is evident in every area of your life. So let's get the mind right. And let's get the mouth right. Folks, listen. If you run off at the mouth, you run off at the mouth to people who are going to repeat it. <laughs> the only ones going to listen to you are folks that repeat everything you say. We got to get holy. And it begins with our mind, and it first shows up in our mouth. The rest of this stuff don't matter if you don't have your mind and your mouth lined up. I'm going to say it's worse. If you look like a holy roller and act like a devil worshiper with your mouth, you destroyed your witness. It happens in here sometimes. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Here we are. we got to tighten up. The devil's after you. And he liked nothing better than to destroy your witness. And a good reputation takes years to gain and seconds to lose. Okay. The world, excuse me, when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, we are also representing them to others in the same manner. Modestly, I ain't forgot about that. Don't be showing your junk off to everybody, your business off to everybody. Keep it covered up. I don't know if y'all noticed this or not. My wife mentioned it to me yesterday there is a movement, even in Hollywood, of modesty and shamefacedness. And they celebrate being real. We've been doing that since who flung the chunk? Y'all don't realize it. We're becoming cool. That's what happened when we just started getting put on TV. Trend setting. 
holiness. The world has an agenda, though, all joking aside. And that agenda, in no small part, matter of fact, it's in your face right now, includes blurring the God-given lines of distinction between men and women, and the end game is to destroy those lines and to do away with any gender distinction. That's the agenda of the world. And if that's the agenda of the world, then we have got to, as the church, be opposite of that. Because the spirit of Antichrist is what rules the world. And the spirit of Jesus Christ is what lives in us. And the differences better show up. At the end of the day, I want you to hear me. This is not pipe dream. This is not craziness. It's true. At the end of the day, the enemy's goal is to eradicate mankind. Why? He can't, well, Brother Chris, I feel the preaching spirit on me. I'm trying not to, but I feel it on me. He can't do anything against God. So the next best thing is attack the image of God. And there's only one creation made in the image and likeness of God. That's us. Dogs are not in the image and likeness of God. I don't care how much you love your little pooch. Cats are not. Fish are not. Turtles are not. Hamsters are not. Guinea pigs are not. The only thing created being made in the image and likeness of God is us. And the enemy is trying to destroy that. Because if he destroys us, he renders the price that Jesus paid on Calvary unnecessary, of no impact, of no good. And the almost rabid, hear me, I said it right, the almost rabid promotion of homosexuality, abortion, and an increasingly uh, powerful manifestation of the selfish determination to not have children. All three of those things are pushed by the world. Homosexuality and abortion and don't have kids. Y'all seen that? Oh, it's showing up all in the world. They're teaching us you can't afford to have more than two. Oh, did I get a little, make us nervous? Think about it. Abortion, no babies. Homosexuality, no babies. People not having kids no more, no babies. What has the enemy done? Make sense? Huh? Because what did the Lord tell the devil? The seed of the woman is going to crush your head. The greatest tool that God has against the devil, he can't do any more against the devil. He done kicked him out of heaven. He's going to bind him up for a thousand years. But the, the, the greatest offense that the Lord has against the devil is for men and women to live holy, godly, and righteously, truly in the image of God. Does what I just said make sense? Yes. We're made in the image and likeness of God. Yes. Through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we're born again into the moral image of God. Physical creation, spiritual moral image, ethical image. Four ways that the world is destroying the gender distinction lines. Number one, sexuality. You can have sex with whoever you want or whatever you want. Don't think I'm crazy. Don't you think I'm crazy? Already in the European countries, been people trying to get relationships with animals. No, it's happening in our world. Okay, it's it's happening. I saw I saw this one good-hearted fella fighting against this stuff like on a school board back in Massachusetts or somewhere over on the East Coast. And he said, what are we going to do when somebody shows up here trying to get married to their mom? <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, and, and I, won't, I won't dilly-dally around here very long, but do you realize the complete, asinine, idiotic truth that we even have to discuss some of this stuff? If we ever needed holiness in the church or in the world, we need it now. Yes. 
these things that we're teaching are more essential today than they have ever been in the history of mankind. Now, people are going to come here, they're going to be transgender. Get ready for it. They're coming. Guess what they're going to find when they get here? Somebody's going to love them. We're not going to be afraid because I warned you. I preached a whole lot of crazy stuff over the last 11 years that's come to pass. Some of y'all being here is that. Huh? Huh? Listen, we're going to have all kinds of different folks come here, and they got to be loved more than anything. Because loving them is going to get them connected with Jesus, who can heal them, who can change them, who can rearrange them. You can't do it. I can't do it. But he can. You know how I know he can? Because that's what he did to me. He took my messed up self and got me on the right track. And I'm on my way to being all right. I ain't arrived yet. Don't think that. I ain't arrived yet, but I'm a long way from where I used to be. Right. Sexuality. That's one way the world is blurring the distinctions. They decide now that gender is a choice rather than a biological designation. That's what the world's teaching. Not only is the world teaching it, people are buying it hook, line, and sinker. Then it's dress, which is the choice of clothes we wear, and then hair, which we will discuss in our next Bible study. Christians are called, Brother Robert's going to like this because he pointed it out to my attention, brought it back to me a few weeks ago, but I don't forget things that get said to me. Christians, and I use the term generally just like it is intended, everybody that's truly a follower of Jesus Christ are called to be the tip of the spear, so to speak, in the war to return to and to maintain the created order that God designed in the beginning. Christians are called to be the tip of the spear in returning and maintaining creative order that God designed. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18 and 2 Corinthians 7 and 1 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you. How do you get to be a son of God? Be led by the Spirit. Huh? Ain't that what the book says? As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they shall be called the sons of God, and I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Verse number 1 of chapter 7. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What does it mean to perfect holiness? Get it completely done. Arrive at what is holy in the mind and eyes of God to pursue the perfection of holiness. And how do we do that? It's in the word I just read to you. <laughs> Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh as, yep, and the spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What does that mean? What does the fear of God mean to you? Respect. That's, you don't want to disappoint God. What he thinks matters above anybody else. He's the most powerful entity I know. God is. And, and I want him to be pleasing to him. I want to live my life pleasing to him. So we got to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's our goal in working through this series is that we might perfect holiness in the fear of God. All respect, awareness of who he is and what he does. Let's talk about what the Bible has to say about gender distinction and dress. First Samuel chapter 16 and 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance, that's his face, or on the height of his stature, that's how big he is, 
because I have refused him. For the Lord, here's the most important part of this. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. We are representatives of Jesus Christ in this world that we live in. Jesus does look at the heart, but the world looks at the outer man. They can't see your heart unless it shows up. That's why we have to be concerned with what we look like and how we present ourselves as holy unto the Lord, as representatives of the Lord God Almighty, not as a weapon to make the world feel bad about themselves. Not as a way to elevate our holiness. You don't have any. But I thought, I, no, you don't have any holiness. We're only holy as Jesus Christ shows up through us. If because you dress a certain way and have your hair a certain way and don't have this and don't have this and don't have all that other stuff and you think you're all that in a box of Cracker Jacks, you're not nothing but a Pharisee. Because you know what the Pharisees were proud that they could do, Sister Maria? They could bust open the whole scroll. Yep. Yeah. I'm that. Yep. I'm that. Yep. I'm that. Y'all seeing this? Yeah. I'm that. That's all it was about was operating on this level. Right. But our holiness pre is presenting him through us. And that's why there's a depth of the spirit that's going to start operating in you. when you, Sister Stephanie, I want you to hold on to what you testified about. In prayer meeting, you hold on to that for a couple of weeks because I ain't thought about nothing but that since you said it. That was one of the most powerful demonstrations of what covenant relationship with God means that I have ever heard. Just off the cuff. Wait, she'll see it. Brother Chris has experienced it. Now y'all ain't going to be thinking about nothing but what she's going to say for the rest of the night. Look, ladies, wasn't that powerful? Wasn't that beautiful? That was beautiful. I did tell Sister Miss Jane about it because we were having a conversation about the Kool-Aid man. I, got, I wear a big red shirt sometimes. I look like the Kool-Aid man. Oh, Lord. The world, the world knows if you're apostolic or not first based upon how you look. It's the way it is. It's the way it is. Let's see what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 22 and 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment... For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now there are two admonitions here that speak to the very same thing, but there are also very pointed differences. It very clearly states that there is apparel for men and apparel for women. Right? Okay. The man... Now... 2012 was the first time I taught this series as pastor... So 11 years ago, do y'all realize how much has changed in 11 years? When I said dudes don't need to be wearing women's clothes, everybody laughed. Like, that's the craziest thing. How many dudes you see going to try to put a dress on? Guess what? It ain't funny no more. Because it's happening all the time. But it's just as important for men not to wear women's clothes as it is for women not to wear men's clothes. It's in the same scripture. It's the same thing. But Sister Maria, we never hardly talked about that because it wasn't a deal. It is now. You fellas don't be going to Cato shopping unless you're going for your wife. 
They used to know me in Kato's. Hey, yeah, baby, don't be telling everything. I remember going into Kato's and a new girl was in there and she said, hey, sir, can I help you? And the manager said, don't bother him. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> true story. I didn't make that up. That's a true story. But let me tell you something. I got some eyeballs from people when I go in there shopping. I make sure I stay in the smaller section. Because I know if I get in the larger section that they're thinking, I know what that stupid dude's looking for. <laughs> but the book says men can't put on any women's clothes. You see that? A man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Okay? The man is simply instructed to not put on a woman's garment. Because then... As now, there is no debate as to what type of clothing a woman wears. Everybody knows what the woman's clothes. But the man, excuse me, women were instructed to not wear anything that pertaineth to a man. Here's what pertain means. It means to relate, have reference to, be appropriate for, belong as an accessory, attribute, feature, or function. The Latin root word of pertain means to reach toward. That means a woman mustn't allow her feminine apparel to reach toward a man's clothing. It's not even supposed to resemble a man's clothing. I'm going to get in the robe question next, so I started to jump ahead. But you can change the color, the style, the name, etc. But if the clothing reaches toward or resembles a man's clothing, it is clothing that should not be worn by people desiring to be pleasing to God. Did y'all get all that? Yeah. Pertaining means just going toward it. Yeah. Now, we're, we're going to get it. I, I started to jump ahead a few times. The robe question. Because people always want to say, well, in the Bible, they all wore robes. They did. True story. How can this apply to us? This quote is from Zondervan Pictorial Bible Dictionary, which is not apostolic, by the way. It's not a Pentecostal publication. The clothing worn by the Hebrew people of biblical times was graceful, modest, and exceedingly significant. They were considered so much a part of those who wore them that they not only told who and what they were, but were intended as external symbols of the individual's innermost feelings and deepest desires and his or her moral urge to represent God aright. I ain't making that up. I got that out of a Bible dictionary. Among the Hebrews, neither sex was permitted by Mosaic law to wear the same form of clothing as was used by the other, Deuteronomy 22, 5. A few articles of female clothing carried somewhat the same name and basic pattern, yet there was always sufficient difference in embossing, embroidery, and needlework so that in appearance, the line of demarcation between men and women could be readily detected even from a distance. We don't really even have to know what the difference was in men's and women's clothes in the Bible. We just got to know there was a difference. I don't need to know what was on the robe that made it different. You want to know why? We don't wear robes. Unless you're John Henry. That's my father-in-law, who some of y'all didn't get the privilege to know, but it was a robe-wearing rascal. And it was all time a man's robe. I can see, I see him right now. Sitting out on the front porch, that old duster, that's what he called it. We bought him a new one. I don't know if he ever wore it. It had to be wore out before it was ready for him. Anyway, I digress. The most important gender distinction wasn't in what they wore, but how they wore it. There was a male way and a female way. First of all, priests wore breeches. The word only occurs a handful of times in Scripture, but always was man's clothing. Women were not allowed to wear breeches. 
Women in biblical times did not wear crotched garments due to the disapproval of God. It's only in the last hundred years or so that women's apparel has become impractical. For the first 5,900 years or so of human existence, men were the only one that wore pants. It just got impractical in the last century. Men were allowed to gird up their loins. Y'all remember me talking about that? Yeah. Where you bring the back of your robe under and put it in your belt and form pants? Yeah. Women were not allowed to gird up their loins. Women could lift up their hem, H-E-M. They could lift up their hem to carry things in their robe, but they had to be very conscious and cognizant to not bring it above their knees or they would be mis immodest. And let's talk about that scripture. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. For this to matter to us, we got to first know what an abomination is. It's a root word that means something's disgusting, filthy, loathsome, or abhorrent. Word for, occurs 40 times in the first five books of the Bible. And these were the things that were abomination. Un, there, there are things that were an abomination unto the people, but only a handful of things that were an abomination unto the Lord, which means this is what the Lord thinks about this. Some things referred to as an abomination unto the Lord are prostitution, homosexuality, idolatry, involvement in the occult, or to be a murderer. Those things were abomination to the Lord. There are several others, but the point being that these issues are not trivial to the Lord. It's a big deal to God. They matter to God, and the reason why they matter to God is they preserve creative order. He made us how he wanted us to be, and he wanted us to stay that way, and we did until sin came in. We're on the way back. Man, I have read some powerful stuff, some beautiful, powerful stuff. Am I okay? I told y'all in the beginning, if we teach or preach things that you don't agree with or you don't see it just yet, just keep on coming to church. Ain't no holiness police going to stand out there flashing their badge at you. If they do, I am begging you, be a tattletale to me. Because I will, to use Gary King vernacular, cloud up and rain all over them. Some of you have been getting close. <laughs> Keep your mouth off of people. Right. Right. That ain't lining up the way you think. You ain't the pastor. Right. There's one pastor here. His name's G Money. <laughs> God put me here, and I'm going to be here till the Lord gets ready for me. Right. You ain't the holiness police. I put them out of business. <laughs> Fired them all. It's been happening. They come and tell me. They come and tell me. They also come and tell me when you get in front of new converts and say, well, I don't really agree with that either. They come and tell me. Because new worshipers love me, don't they, Brenton? And he ain't the one that did it. <laughs> you ain't the one. Here. He knows good well. We, everything's cool between us, isn't it? Yes, sir. What's that mean? Okay. I told y'all we was turning cool. <laughs> there are three areas that the Jewish law distinctly covered. One is the civil law, which those still apply in principle, but they don't apply in actuality. For instance, if your ox gets his horns down and gores somebody's servant to death, under the civil law, then you had to pay the price of a servant restitution. We obviously ain't using too many oxen nowadays. Some of us probably ain't never seen one. Okay? But that's the, the, the principle still applies. If you tear up something that belongs to somebody else, take care of it. Okay? The ceremonial law that the Jews lived under does no longer apply to us. That's the customs of Israel, which is, though the principle still does, they said don't plow with an ox and a donkey at the same time. Okay? 
they don't go together. Don't put certain materials together because they don't go together. One of them will shrink more than the other one. It's just stuff that makes sense. I don't know what they are because I don't know nothing about materials. Except I know the setting on the iron and you look at the tag and you put it on the right one. Because if you don't, you burn your britches. Hole in them. Did it. So we've got the civil law that the Jews live under that doesn't apply to us in actuality but applies to us in principle. We've got the ceremonial law that the Jews live under, which we don't have to do. Like if you get leprosy, you don't have to go get two birds and kill one under running water and go show yourself to the priest and all that stuff. All right? But the moral law that the Jews lived under always has and always will apply because it is based upon God's holy nature. Now, all moral law outside of the Ten Commandments is accompanied by the phrase to violate it is an abomination unto the Lord. Now, men and women are created by God with different emotions, desires, and physical makeup. We are to maintain and celebrate those differences, especially the ones we have control over, which speaks to submission to the will of God. Remember, that, that's what we were talking about, Brenton, is, is I've got to make sure my want to lines up first which is I want to be pleasing to God. I don't really know what that looks like all the time in every situation. But if I want to be pleasing to God, Brother Jerry, he's going to show me what's pleasing to him. That's why I got the Holy Ghost for Because you go stepping off into something you got no business stepping on, you did the Holy Ghost alone. Woo, 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 woo. Signs start popping up. And all kinds of stuff starts happening. He ain't going to go let you sin in peace. Matter of fact, I've told you this and I'll say it again. If I have to call you out on something, it's because the Lord already did it and you didn't listen. The Holy Ghost does what it's supposed to do. Sometimes we just need to reinforce it. The matter of separation and dress goes back to the order of creation. To rebel against this is to rebel against God, our Creator. Satan was removed from heaven because of pride and rebellion. He desired to be above God. The work of society to rebel against the created order of God is a blatant attempt by Satan to fulfill his greatest desire. The pride, the rebellion, the immorality, the very thing. How many of you have heard people say with regard to gender distinction, I've heard it more than once, God just made a mistake with me. All right, hear me when I tell you, he ain't never made a mistake. Not one human being has he created as a mistake. Everybody is fearfully and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of God. What we preach and teach regarding behavior and dress, I want you to hear this. It's biblically correct and spiritually approved but it has become antiquated in the mind of society. What we preach and teach is considered weird by a society that just a short time ago lived the same way. Where are we going then? What's going to be normal next year? Now, I don't believe that. If you don't grasp a hold of the foundational principles of the doctrine and of the word of God, you believe anything. Because the book says, because they receive not a love for the truth, that God will send them a strong delusion. You will believe a lie and be damned. A genderless society is clearly repudiated by Scripture and the plan of God. But it is the driving force of mainstream media, celebrities, and politicians. Brother Woodward said this, and I like it, so I copied it. The wolf has...
has taken off the sheep's clothing. These principles are more necessary today than they've ever been. The mission of the church is to spread the whole gospel to the whole world, which includes adhering to the principles laid out for us in Scripture so that we might fully fulfill the Word of God. Matthew 5 and 14 says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. It's not self-righteousness. It's not works for salvation. It is a result that I know what the enemy's trying to do, and I'm not going to go along with it. I know what the enemy's trying to do, and I will not bow down to his wishes. It is the knowledge of what God desires to do, and I will submit myself to his will. I'm reading about Azusa Street. I told you all that Sunday. And it is repeated over and over and over. Them folks prayed. Jack, y'all think we got calling on you to pray too much? I don't know if any of us would have made it back then. They prayed for three, four, five days in a row. They came to church. I told the ladies this Monday night. They came to church. They didn't shout the preacher down. They just prayed so there wasn't no preaching. You think they got in a rush to get out and go somewhere and eat dinner? Or eat supper? Brother Blake, there was more than once. Repeatedly, they stayed at church midweek service till the sun came up in the morning. Praying all night long. And we're quibbling over how much we can look like the world and still be saved. I would submit to you that the more we pray and fast with a right heart, because you pray till the cows come home and have a messed up spirit, and I am convinced that the Lord sits up in heaven. I know we don't do this, but this is how I see it. He sits up in heaven going, it's a small world after all. I, he's not listening. And people will pray and pray and pray for a show. But when you get it in your heart, yeah. oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this room right now. And I want to please him more than anything in the world and more than anybody else in the world. And before I go to bed at night, Brother Christian, I say, Lord, I just want you to know I'm giving you permission to wake me up. If you need to take my sleep from me, take it from me because I want revival. I want the people of New Madrid to flood in these doors. Y'all know they watch us online, hundreds of them. They're attracted. They're attracted. You know what they told me? I've had this conversation this week. They're attracted to life. They want church that's alive. They want church that when you walk in the door, you say, hold up a minute. What is that? true. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not embellishing. It's true. What's going on here? I ain't never felt this before. Come on, I've had people come here to funerals and say they ain't never felt nothing in their life like they felt in a funeral in this place. It's real. It's real. I know it's real. But we got to be ever, we got to be all of it. And I will tell you, if you get where you're supposed to be with God, this stuff it's just going to come natural. I love the Lord. I'm about to wind it up. God, I want to stay in this all I can because I know good and well by the time I get in my truck, the devil's going to say, you ran half of them off tonight, you big dummy. No, it, it just, it's the devil. I know it. I know it. But you can't run nobody off that's with you. Because Brother David, Peter and them boys did not understand everything about the Lord. But they did say, where are we going to go? If we're going to learn about eternal life, it's coming from you. So where are we going to go? Who are we going to go to? Ain't nowhere else to go. And if I didn't think this was it, 
I'd fill out a resignation and I'd go find what it is. I got to believe God loves holiness and separation because he wants to be able to function and operate through us. And he can't do that when we got one foot in the world and one foot in the church house. He wants us to be sold out. He wants us to be committed. He wants to be able to take your breakfast, lunch, and supper. He wants to be able to take your vacation. He wants to be able to take your sleep and work through you to help change the world and bring people to salvation. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. It's not self-righteousness. It's not what you do to be saved. It's who you are because you are saved. And if I read the book right, the more I go on this way, the more weight and sin I'm going to have to turn loose of. Let me, let me read you something. I'm getting all kinds of text messages. People know where I'd be at on Wednesday night. To be the light of truth sitting on a hill, a clear direction for a world that's lost their way. Matthew 5 and 16, he says, let your light so shine before men. How are they going to see the Holy Ghost in you? The way you live your life, the way you present yourself, the stand you've taken and the message you preach with your life, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let me read you this and then I'm going to close. I got another page, but save it for another time. Deuteronomy 32, 48 through 51. Did you do that, Sister Scar? Did you? Okay. In the NIV? I got this in the bread. I'm reading the NIV this year. I bought me a journal Bible. Uh, anybody ever seen one of the journal Bibles? where they got the, the margins in the side for you to write in. I bought an NIV this year. I already bought the New Living Translation for next year. I don't know what the next year, but I'm reading it through, Brother Christian, and I'm writing in the, the margins, journal and stuff. And then at the end of the year, I'm going to give it to my children as something that they can keep. And uh, I heard Brother Huntley say he did that, and I thought, well, that's a wonderful idea. So I'm going to give that to my kids. But this is what I found while I was reading it. Deuteronomy 32, 48 through 51 in the NIV. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why did Moses not get to, did anybody read about that in the bread? Moses didn't get to go to the promised land? Why didn't he get to go to the promised land? Now, I want you to think about this as we read it. On that same day, the Lord told Moses, Go up unto the Abiram range to Mount Nebo in Moab across from Jericho and view Canaan, the land I'm giving the Israelites as their own possession. There on the mountain that you have climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. This is just something for you to think about. Your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. I want you to think about this. I read it. Brother David, I read it over and again. And I can't find in there anywhere. When God told Moses and Aaron in their presence, he told them, speak to the rock. And they smote it. Not one person knew that Moses had violated the law of God but him, Aaron, and God. But the Lord said... You broke faith with me because you did not uphold my holiness in front of the people. The people never knew it. There's a high calling upon your life. 
between you and God. And your validation does not come from anybody in your arena. It comes from heaven. And we are called to a higher calling. Huh? Nobody knew he violated the law of God but him and Aaron and God. But the Lord said, you're going to be required for what you did not uphold before me. I think that's something to think about, folks. What you got, Kevin? Take us home, brother. Uh huh. The only trouble is, standards are not God's holiness, they're representative that my heart is holy before Him. Does that make sense to you? And I am pursuing that holiness and gender distinction and the other areas we're going to cover. I'm in pursuit of that holiness. And as the Lord, I, I have heard people talk about that. Trust me when I tell you, the Holy Ghost will bring you where he wants you to be. Trust me when I tell you that. But what my responsibility as your pastor is, is to expound upon the word of God and lay out the clearly defined plan of God for creative order. Which is, men be men, and women be women, and never the twain shall meet. The lines can't be blurred. Stand with me. Sunday morning is Easter. Sister Katie... Poor thing, she did such, she tried so hard, but these are just terrible. <laughs> she told my wife that, that's why I said that. <laughs> these are wonderful. Katie went to one of them drug stores, uh, and she made these up for the church wow. for invitations for Easter Sunday. Aww. And, well, that's, that's all cute and well till I tell you, you're going to have to take them and hand them out. Because we brought 300 of them. Oh, that ain't many for this crowd. That ain't no mountain for a climber. Yeah, if we need more, we get more. But between now and Saturday evening, maybe Sunday morning, ain't, ain't no shame in my game. Go to Casey's. On your way here, Brent, Brenton, go to Casey's. Logan, don't let him forget. But I, I, I'm going to ask you to take these and give them to folks. Don't take them and put them on your visor. It ain't taking them that's good. It's giving them out that's good. But aren't we glad that Katie did this? This is her idea. This is. I think it's wonderful. She said they didn't turn out like she wanted them to, but Blake's just rubbed off on her. That, that perfection stuff. I wanted you to change him, not the other way around. Work on that. But anyway, you're going to see these. These are wonderful. They're, they're picture size, postcard size, and we've got them. And uh, here you go, brother. Go to the back door. Go back there. Don't let them leave without taking some. Look at here. you got them. Go stand by and back there. They're going to try to sneak around you on this other side. Brother Jerry, you leaving quick tonight or you going to hang around a minute? Are you? I was afraid of that. Sister Sheila, anybody who comes by that door trying to get out the side way, whoop some of them on them. If you get tired and ready to go home, Lacey said she'll pick up your slack. <laughs> you especially don't let, don't you let Brother Jerry's sister Tina go by without giving them a stack. She's already been thinking in her mind, uh, y'all give them away to Wardell people. We got people come worldwide, River Bend, worldwide. Amen? Amen. We need eggs. We need plastic eggs. You can get them with stuff in them or you can get them just empty. Brother Derek said it's super cool to buy them with stuff already in them. But we need real eggs. I don't care if the kids don't like real eggs. I like them better. I like a big old fat boiled egg way better than a little bite-sized snicker bar. That ain't nothing but a tease anyway. 
Boy, you take them boiled eggs and pop them open, shake a little bit of salt on them, and what you talking about? <laughs> Tell you what you can do. You take them eggs and you slice them long ways or spread them out on a piece of bread and put some mayonnaise on it and smash it together and have a boiled egg sandwich. Anybody ever done that before? Huh? Yes, sir, you can do it. We're going to have a great time here Sunday morning, amen? Yeah. Let me tell you something. I know y'all going to look pretty. I know you're going to be right. You're going to be holy. But you ain't coming Easter Sunday to be seen. Y'all don't come in here like a bunch of chickens. All scared because you got visitors coming. Don't you be praying that Brother Derek don't go to run in the aisles and stuff. Just this one day, Lord, don't let him go to run in the aisles. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Y'all know good and well when the visitors come and one brother or sister starts winding it up that you're thinking, oh, Lord, not today, not today, not today, not today. Oh, Lord, any day but today, not today, not today. And then they cut loose and you think, oh, I knew it. It had to be today. Let it be Sunday. We got to plant a seed, folks. And if they wanted to go to another church that don't get excited, they would have went there. That's right. They're coming to Pentecost because they know what Pentecost is. Yes. And so let's be who we're supposed to be. Pray about it. Pray about it. Come fired up, ready to go. We're going to have some church. All right? I see y'all Sunday morning. Hey, we're going to have elements. We're going to eat donuts and coffee over there, and the elements going to be in here at 10 o'clock. Y'all come. <laughs>